Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 208 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, we are going to be talking about mold and sneaky spots that it can hide in. Spots that do not include inside your walls, for example. We'll certainly touch on some of the spots that other practitioners have talked about, but today's episode is really focused on areas that you might not anticipate, you might not think of, and frankly, even for me, were quite shocking. So shocking that I actually had a friend not long after this interview was recorded who did show positive results for mold illness and had mycotoxins present And when we looked at where that mycotoxin was generated from, it was actually coming from an appliance in her home. We're going to talk a whole lot about this today. It's not meant to scare you. It's meant to empower and educate you. So that way you guys know where to look if you are having problems just to double check that there is no crazy, weird, random spot where mold, especially if you're sensitive to it, is hiding. So let me introduce you to my guest today. His name is Brian Carr, and he's a second generation indoor environmental consultant who specializes in working with hypersensitive individuals with complex medical conditions. He helps them to understand if mold, mycotoxins, or other indoor pathogens exist in their home that may be contributing to their health conditions and how to remedy those issues. Brian has become a go-to mold and biotoxin resource for many medical practitioners across the country and has helped over 3,000 hypersensitive individuals nationwide to create healthier living environments that have allowed their doctors to help them get better. So since we had a lot to discuss, let's dive into today's conversation. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Healthy Skin Show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited. I love skin. Skin's great. (laughs) (laughs) It is. But you know what? You're the first person to come on the show to talk about mold, but like you're not a health professional. You're like somebody out there actually kind of searching it out and like seeing how it shows up in structures and things like that, which is much different than somebody who's like running labs and whatnot, because this is more on the practical side of things. And um, before we started, I was telling you how I live in a house where every time it rains because I'm up in like the Philadelphia area and we have wet basements and some basements in my community actually flood when we have heavy rainstorms. So there's, there's a huge potential for mold, but there's a lot of people that don't seem to get really sick. Cause we hear about all these people who are so sick with mold illness. And yet there's people like myself, at least I don't think I am that impacted by mold. I think my audience understands the severity of like mold issues and we can go into more detail on this, but can we start off on like, why is it that some people seem to have issues with mold and then other people don't seem to be as impacted by it? Yeah. I I mean, it comes up all the time because like I'll go into a house and typically what's happening is that one or two of the people are reacting. The other people aren't at all. Right. So that's like a small, like sample set of kind of what you're describing, like the neighborhood, right? Like some people might feel it. Some people don't. And, and usually women start showing signs first before men do. Um, there's some physiological reasons for that. Just, you know, in, in terms of, of mold toxins, when you hear toxic mold, there's literally this chemical toxin that they create. It stores in our fat cells and women physiologically have more fat than men do. So they can build it up quicker. There's also a hormone piece to it. Um, so which kind of leans more towards women sometimes getting impacted, but like getting beyond like the, the male female thing and just thinking like big picture, there's, there's like three big things that kind of determine like how someone is going to react to something. One is their genetic, you know, sort of makeup, right? So basically 25% of the population, you got dealt the crap card and you're going to react worse than other people sucks, but that's just what it is. Right. So like, that's just a genetic thing. The second piece is your previous exposures. So if you were exposed, like as a younger person before your immune system was completely developed. And when I say younger person, and I just learned this like a year ago, like I used to think younger meant 
you know, under 10 years old or something, right? Like a young kid, like your immune system can be developing all the way up until you're close to 20 years old. So if you get hit wow. with like extreme exposures or prolonged exposures or something like that, it actually re rewrites the way that your immune system reacts to things. And it's almost like you're rewriting your DNA in a point to where it's like, okay, now I react, I overreact. I'm hypersensitive now, or maybe you weren't born that way. Um, and then the third thing is, other health conditions that you're dealing with that might also be taxing your immune system. So if you have Lyme disease or autoimmune diseases or a whole bunch of other things, um, it lowers your immune system, makes you more susceptible. Those are just three like basic reasons. But you know, the other reason that I think that it happens is perception. I, mold impacts you in so many different ways to so many different people. It's not just like there's not like one blanket test that you can run and say, I have a mold problem, or there's not like one specific symptom that comes up and says, oh, this is mold, right? It's super complicated. And the symptoms can reflect so many other types of health conditions that you don't even know that mold's really causing it. So a lot of times there are people walking around and they have like chronic fatigue or they have skin problems or they have whatever's going on. No one's actually figured out that mold is what's causing that. But it can be, right? So, so part of it is that people just don't know. You know, you may be walking around and not feeling super great, but you just don't know what's causing it necessarily. Mm. So let's talk about that for a second. Like, how would you know that you have mold? Because I'm going to say, first of all, most people don't realize that you don't have to see mold to have a mold problem. Yep. Most people don't realize that their exposure could come somewhere other than their home. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times people, when I ask, do you have mold or do you think you have mold in your home? And they're like, well, my, my home does not smell moldy. And we just bought this house a year or two ago. And the mold inspector told us that it was clear. They did like an air inspection or something like that. Is that enough to say that you don't have a mold problem? No. And it's so funny because you literally brought up like the biggest myths in that come up, like all of the things that you just said. And I do a webinar that I do um, frequently where I literally call out like one of the things I'm talking about. This is the reason why mold, like most mold inspectors are actually making you more sick. And it's because they're giving you this false sense of security because they're falling into these myths that then make them tell you that there's no way that you have a mold problem when it's completely not true, right? So, so the uh, one thing you mentioned was like air testing comes up and it shows up that it's fine. Air testing in the middle of the room is the worst way to figure out if you have a mold problem in your house. It's, it's the most unreliable type of test to figure it out for a lot of reasons. But one, you know, just kind of easy one to talk about is that whatever's floating around in the air, it, it pops up in the air, it settles back down on the floor, it pops up in the air, it settles back down. So if you're taking an air sample for five minutes, who knows what's floating around the air at that point in time? 10 minutes later, if I came in the room and like jumped on the bed and sat on a chair and moved some stuff around, you would get a different result, right? It's just so variable. There's a lot of other reasons that I, you know, we, <laughs> I can maybe dive into more, but it's just not the best way to do it. Air samples are really great if to find hidden mold. And that kind of goes to the next thing that you mentioned, like, I don't see anything. I don't smell anything. Like, so why do I have a mold issue? Most times when we're in a house, we're not seeing physical mold. Like if, if of all the things that we find, let's say we find 10 potential problems in a house, maybe one or two of them actually look like visible mold. And the other eight or nine of them are things where if you just looked at it, it does, it's, there isn't any visible mold. So like the big secret really to finding hidden mold in your house is to not actually look for mold. It's to understand that that mold is created as a result of, of water being somewhere. So think of like water, um, you know, watering a seed and something grows, right? So if there's no water, then mold isn't going to grow inside any of your structural areas. So then the, the key is really to look for signs of water damage in your home because mold is microscopic. So if you're only looking for that, even if there's some growth in places, you might not see it, but water damage anyone can see, you just have to know what it looks like, right? So if you have a bubbling paint or cracking or chipping somewhere or a buckling, you know, floor or cabinet or something like that. Those are all signs of water intrusion that could have caused that to happen, which means you could have mold hiding behind those different areas that aren't visible to your eye. And that's really a lot of the way that, that people get impacted because as, as homes, you know, are older and things happen, 
there are leaks that happen in homes and people don't necessarily treat them the right way. And then the home ends up building up like this hist this history of things that didn't get treated right. And all of a sudden there's a little source of mold growth over here. And then there's one over here and there's one over here. And you walk in the house and those could have happened 10 years ago, but they still impact the space because the mold doesn't just disappear when the water goes away. It stays there. And so all those things add up. People walk into a house that looks pretty good, you know, visibly they, they painted everything and, you know, they kind of refaced it and everything and you walk in and it doesn't smell because there's not mold growing right now, but that doesn't mean that the, the byproducts aren't still in play. And then after a month or a couple of months, all of a sudden start, people start feeling sick, you know, in those situations and it's, it's because of the history. Uh, can I ask you then, so in my instance, right, so I know every single time we get heavy rain, we get water on the floor. It comes in through, I think, one of the stone walls. Probably mm -hmm. there's a crack in the foundation, I would assume. And it's seeping in the stone wall and coming in on just the concrete. And then it'll it'll dry up or the cement floor, whatever it is. Can you have a problem with, I mean, I imagine wood. Yes, absolutely. But could cement or concrete structures also be a problem if they're constantly getting wet like that? Yeah. And so there's a couple things that could happen with it. One, another misconception is that mold can't grow on like stone or concrete and that's just not true. Um, so there are times where I walk into a basement, you know, you have your foundation walls, whether, you know, cement, uh, brick, stone, kind of whatever it was built out of. And there's actually mold growing on the foundation and I could take a surface test of it and, and it's there. Um, so, so that's one piece. So you could have a source that's actually on those. And again, mold doesn't always look the same. It's not always this disastrous black thing when you do the deep dive on the internet and see all the walls that are black, right? Like it's not always that. And so it could be different colors. It could be really subtle, but it could still be there. So that's kind of one way it happens. The other way that it happens is when you have constant moisture coming into your basement like that, it raises the humidity in the basement. And then there are certain molds that just need humidity to get around 60% to grow all over the surfaces throughout the basement so you could have mold growing on like the framing which is underneath the floor of the stairs above um, simply because the humidity got increased from a water issue that was coming in from the foundation from the outside and so that's one way that it happens and then another big thing that happens is is maybe because of the humidity increasing in the space a lot of people have their furnace or their air conditioning unit in the basement like that's where they stay and so what happens is if you get a moisture issue or a mold issue that starts building up in the basement those mechanical units for the furnace or the air conditioning unit, they can pull air in from the surrounding space that they live in. So, cause they're not airtight sealed. Um, and so what happens if you end up with a mold problem in the basement, it starts to kind of penetrate and peek in through the air conditioning system or the ventilation can impact that and then start spreading throughout the house. And now you start feeling the reactions everywhere and not just, you know, closer to the basement. Basically there's just, there's a lot of different ways it can, it can happen. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and I'm sorry for, for <laughs> dropping that on you. <laughs> oh, well, so what if, if somebody constantly runs a dehumidifier in their basement? Is that a red flag? If the, the dehumidifier, like, say, fills up with water every single day, would that be a red flag that there's probably a lot of humidity in the basement that could fuel this? Well, what it's telling you is that there's a lot of moisture getting in there, right? So okay. the dehumidifier is trying to counteract it and maybe it's managing the humidity piece, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's stopping it for the humidity fills. It may not be stopping the issue directly on the foundation walls or around those areas. So you might get more of a source issue there. It could help manage the humidity throughout the space. The bigger challenge on all this stuff, and this isn't just, you know, drainage from the outside, but this is if I have a leak under the sink or if I have something going on somewhere else, it's about stopping the water intrusion. Like if we try to do band-aids on things and we don't actually fix the source of where the water's coming from, then you're always going to kind of be fighting this never ending battle with, with it versus actually fixing the problem. So let's say you really do have a drainage foundation issue. The waterproofing around your home is probably deteriorated over time because it will happen, right? It doesn't stay functioning forever. I mean, it's going to, it's going to break down. That's probably what's happened. Um, and so there's always a path now for water to get in. And until that gets fixed, then you're always going to have to be trying to fight it on the other side. And it's just, it's just a constant, you know, battle like that. So it sounds like this is really I guess to me, this looks like a two pronged piece. You have to a figure out where the water's coming from and address that, but then simultaneously address what is there growing now. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And the way that we do it is we come in and we basically figure out where all these hidden areas are 
And then, so we kind of address it backwards. So we're going through and we're seeing, all right, is there water damage here? Is there water damage here? Let's test in this wall. Let's test in the ceiling where we see a little stain or some cracking, or let's test in the basement where we see some of these things we're talking about. And we, we basically validate like if there's a mold problem there. And then we, we talk about how it would need to be properly remediated. If it's a wall, you might have to remove the wall and clean the structural components that are back there because mold grows behind there. And so once you do something, some of that stuff now it's open and so now when you're trying to figure out like well where did the water come from a lot of times like if i'm just looking at the wall behind me i don't know is it like from up above is it from down below like where exactly is it coming from when you open it you can now start seeing like where is it darker where's the staining at and you can start kind of like pinpointing it so you're absolutely right like you have to fix the source coming in sometimes you back into it on like where it's coming from because you don't always know where it's coming from but at the end both of those pieces ha definitely have to be addressed mm. I mean, this is, these are like the pra the practical questions that a lot of times, you know, I have, I've asked other doctors and they're like, well, that's really for like, a, you know, someone who really deals with this, but it's, it's hard to find out some of these very just basic questions if you don't know. Cause I, I mean, there's plenty of practitioners that deal with mold in their practice, but they're not a specialist like you are. Like you go into a home and you're actually seeking out mold. Um, I also mentioned too that you don't have to get mold. Like you could, you may have mold in your work. I've had some clients where like they worked in a really moldy hospital where they knew that there was a lot of mold problems. Um, but you can also have mold in your car, correct? Yeah. I mean, mold, it cross contaminates, it moves to different places. A lot of times, if you have a significant mold issue, let's say in your house, you put stuff from your house in your, in your car, right? Like, I mean, here's like a bigger example for me. So like I go into like really bad houses all the time, right? So like, like my body actually thinks that I just live in like a really terrible moldy house. And in turn, I've developed, I have three mold toxins in my body. I've developed skin issues. I've developed gut issues all as a result of the exposure that I'm now constantly trying to detox out because I've been building out forever. So I get like flare ups and different things. And, but my car, because I'm constantly like bringing my equipment into these houses and I'm bringing it back out, even though I'm cleaning everything to try to avoid as much as I can before I go into new places, there's stuff in my car now, right? So I'm getting rid of my car because, because how am I getting away from the exposure? Like all the doctors that really specialize in this, the mold literate doctors, the ones that get it, they're all going to say the same thing. They're going to say, I can put you on a treatment protocol and it'll, you know, it'll be X effective. But the real thing is you have to get out of the exposure yeah. first if you want any of this stuff to work. And, and so, you, you know, the car can be part of it. Different things can be part of it. And it's tough. You know, it, the way that I look at it, I don't want people to feel like you have to do everything at once. Where do you spend the most time? You spend the most time in your house usually. Let's focus there first. Let's get that into a good place. Um, the nice thing about where we are now is a lot of us are working remote. Like maybe we can be out of some of those situations and workplaces and not be exposed as often. And if you're not as exposed as often, it's giving your immune system a little time to rebalance, kind of, you know, and, and work on the detoxing path that their doctors will put them on. Over time, they'll get a little stronger. They'll be able to hopefully uh, um, handle some of like the smaller, shorter term exposures that come up and continue to kind of build back. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you, so when I'm uh, dress, uh, assessing a client, I do think about where they live, right? So if someone is in like the Houston area, I will ask because of the hurricanes, I will ask, has your home, like what happened in the past? Was there flooding? And I have worked with some clients whose homes were flooded. Um, yeah. The same goes for Florida because of the hurricanes that have hit there. Recently, I've noticed an interesting pattern in folks who were in like Los Angeles, where a lot of people have very moldy bathrooms. And I think of LA as being very dry, but it seems to be more of a pattern that maybe there's issues with like, are there certain cities or areas that you find that people assume that there really shouldn't be mold, but maybe there is? Yeah, there's like two really good questions in that. The last one is something where people think if I move to the desert where there's no humidity and there's no water, I'm going to go live in Arizona or Vegas or something that I'm going to have no mold problems. This is it. We're going to move there and everything's going to be fixed. The reality is 
Honestly, 90% of your mold problems in a house has nothing to do with where you live. It has to do with what's happening inside of your house. Have you had water leaks? Is the air conditioning system functioning properly? Is it leaking? Did you have an issue under your sink where you just thought, oh, it's normal, sinks leak, I'm not gonna handle it, when the reality is that's causing a problem. Has there been a previous flood that impacted that space? Maybe you had a slab leak. Maybe the owner, two owners before you had a slab leak and never told you about it, and it's still in the house. Like there's so many things that can, that can interact with that stuff. Where you live, while it may, I'm not gonna say it doesn't, it can't have an impact, it could if things aren't kind of managed properly. But the reality is, is most of it has nothing to do with where you live. Um, and it has to do with how water issues have been handled in your particular home over time, which leads you to LA, which I, I, um, I'm in Orange County now, but I lived in LA for like eight years. Um, everything is so old and so not taken care of. And uh, landlords, they don't want to take care of this stuff, right? Like their business is, I'm going to turn cash flow off of this apartment unit and I need to keep costs down as much as I can in order to, to make my profit numbers that I'm trying to do in the year. If you come in, you're like, oh, hey, I had this leak and I need remediation that costs, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000. They literally have lost their profit margin on your unit for probably two to three years. So they're not doing it, right? They're, they're covering stuff up, they're patching over it. Now you move into an apartment, this happened to me in like four apartments I lived in. You move into an apartment that's really old, it was built in the 70s and the 60s and the whatever. It's had all these problems, it's been owned by landlords for X amount of time, they clearly are not gonna handle things properly. You're literally walking into this historical disaster, but they painted everything so it looks nice. Right, and you get exposed. So that's why, like things in those older buildings, like you're talking about LA, it's it's a big problem. But then when you talk about like Houston, um, even Jersey from Hurricane Sandy, you talk about you know Florida. So that's a whole nother thing, right? Any building that has been impacted like a major water event like that. I just did, I, we did like an entire fundraiser thing called After the Storm that was specific for like the Houston stuff to try to help people understand how to navigate like post flood and what you do and things like that. But the, the thing is, is, that, is that there are uh, these companies that, that we call storm chasers and they're like remediation companies basically. They're not really remediation companies, but they come in and they say, okay, we're, they find a natural disaster, follow it, and they know that there's going to be hundreds and thousands of homes that need quick uh, water drying and things just to kind of get out of the house. And they're like, we'll hand, we'll work with your insurance and everything. And they go to the insurance and like, they're not fighting your insurance to make sure things are handled properly. They're figuring out the maximum money they can get from your insurance, taking all of it, doing a crap job of cleaning stuff up in your house. And then you think that everything was remediated properly. Your insurance claim is now gone because it's been claimed. So you can't ever go back and actually get it done the right way through insurance. And they literally are screwing people and putting them in terrible situations and just like patching stuff and not doing anything. And you end up with all these homes that were impacted by these hurricanes. Literally, I'm, I'm telling you for like 50 years from now, there's going to be massive, massive epidemic of, of sick autoimmune, um, you know, all these different types of issues that are that are resonating from these types of, of large historical things. I like was going to say, too, even in Texas, where they had that freeze up and we saw video upon video upon video of people's pipes in their ceilings burst and they have water pouring through the ceilings once everything stopped being frozen. I would imagine I don't even know where you begin to clean up that kind of damage. Yeah, and I did like a really long thing on this to try to like help outline it. But the the point of it, like in quick summary, is you kind of have to understand a song. Everybody document everything. Look where where it went. Understanding where the water went is so helpful when you're then trying to figure out like how am I going to handle and clean and remediate and fix everything. Because a lot of times like the further away you get from the source, say the pipe burst in the ceiling, right? Let's say it hits the kitchen floor or something and kind of spreads horizontally like it will. Maybe it impacted a bedroom on the other side. Maybe it went, you know, somewhere else, but it's not, it didn't really go over there that bad. And so when it dries up, it doesn't really leave any visible clue that it was over there. And so then you think, well, I just have to fix the ceiling where the water hit and like maybe the floor. And that's kind of where you're at. Cause that's visibly what you remember. Cause it was so bad, but water moves and travels in a lot of different ways. And so like the really important part of that is to map out like where the moisture went, 
always look a room beyond like when i'm doing testing when there's flood issues i'm actually testing walls in the room next to wherever the room was was impacted even if there's no signs of anything i'm like we're doing a test on this wall this wall and this wall we have to make sure that it didn't get over here and that's kind of how you you try to map all that out and hopefully avoid those types of things but yeah it was brutal that that all of that was brutal yeah. And now, do you use ERMI testing, the ERMI test, as part of what you recommend people actually look for if they're going to look for mold? Yeah, it's it's uh, we use it for a particular reason when we're in homes, but it's also a really good screening test for homeowners to do on their own. And it's super easy to do. They the you the lab literally mails you what is essentially a sterilized Swiffer pad. And then you go around and collect dust from throughout your house. And it's a dust analysis. Remember I was talking about air samples and why it's like just, you know, pops up in the air and then it settles down and pops up. That's part of the reason why air samples aren't, aren't great. Dust is everything has settled down onto the surfaces and stays there. You can find dust reservoirs that's that are years old if you haven't cleaned under certain areas. And it gives you such a historic view of what's been moving through a house, what's getting resuspended into your breathing zone and what you're being exposed to. So Ermi's are really good just screening test. If you're like, yeah, I don't know, like I might be feeling off or my doctor thinks something is going on in here. I don't think there's a problem, but you know what? I'm, I, let's try to find out. You can do an ERMI test on your own really easily. And you, when the results come back, you know, it's not the easiest thing for people to read, but when it's not good, it's very clear that it's not good. And so you can be like, oh, okay, there's something going on. This is telling me I need to do like further investigation. I have to find out where it's coming from. And that's kind of like what our goal is. When we go and we have two goals. One is where, where are the sources? Where is it hiding? Where, where do we, where are the factories that are creating this problem in the first place, right? When you drive by a factory, smoke comes out of the top, right? It's not the factory that we're breathing. It's the smoke the factory creates that we're breathing. Same thing with mold. You may have a mold colony, which is the equivalent of your factory. It's not that that colony directly is what's causing your problem, but it's the spores and the byproducts and the toxins it creates. So the, it, the way to stop this air pollution is you have to shut the factory down first. So you have to figure out where all of those are. That's where a really deep dive inspection. We spend probably four or five, six hours in a house just trying to figure that piece of it out. And then the second piece is the dust collection, like the ERMI, and that kind of tells you what's moving throughout the space. Mm. So this is making me wonder about appliances that use water. So like dishwashers, washing machines, like what if you have, so everyone knows, I think it's common knowledge. Everyone knows darn front, front loaders of yeah. the washing machines are really bad. They are notorious for getting mold. So if they have mold in them, is that essentially, I mean, you wash your clothes, but could you end up with clothes if they're being washed in a moldy environment that still have mold in them and would the same be true if say you have a dishwasher that's moldy like are you, is your stuff really getting clean or do you should you be concerned about that I'd be concerned about it. I mean, when I see those front loaders, like you describe, you know, and I show people and, and like literally anyone could go search on the internet, like front load washing machine mold. And they pull, they open up the rubber gasket and it's just like covered in there. And yeah, you're washing your clothes in that. Right. So it's not that like molds growing on your stuff, but the fragments and the, and the different things that break off the colonies, they get into the fibers of the clothing. And so you can end up kind of having that there right now with dishes and stuff, hopefully it's a little better because they're more solid. It's ceramic dishes, things like that. So you're not getting stuff wedged in it as much. Is it ideal to be washing it in moldy water? Like, no, like you want to make sure you're not doing that, but, but washing machines, big, uh, refrigerators with ice makers, really big, like water dispensers and ice makers. Anyone listening to this, if you have a refrigerator uh, that has like a, a water you know, dispenser thing in it, go look up, up into it where the ice comes out of. And half of you people that are listening right now are going to find mold growing on that. Um, and then you start thinking like, this is where my water's coming from. This is where my ice is coming from. I didn't even know this trick until I saw somebody else do it just randomly. And I was like, whoa, wait a second. Like, I need to go look at this because I'm always so worried about the structural components in the house that, that I wasn't at the time. I wasn't really looking at the appliances very closely. It's a few years ago. And then I go look in mine and it is covered. I'm like, shut up. I'm like, shut <laughs> up right now. And um, I, you know, I cleaned it the best that I could. Uh, you know, I'm renting, so I can't like just get a new fridge, right? And then I got a Berkey water filter. And ever since then, I don't use anything that comes out of any rubber line, any water thing for that I'm drinking or anything like that. And I use Berkey filters for everything. Yeah, that makes me feel better. I use Berkey too. Yeah. <laughs> so 
okay well that that's a good random thing i didn't i had no idea it was going to come out of this i i it does a friend of mine had brought this to my attention the other day because she had um mold um a mycotoxin test done on herself and it came back with this random thing that like probably is from, from the house and she's like well our dishwasher we realized had some leak someplace and we realized the dishwasher was really moldy and so they recently got rid of the dishwasher and that as you were talking I was like what about appliances that's a good question uh, and 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 one last I think this is another really good question too if someone has had an exposure to mold I don't want to be the person to say this because I think it's pretty ex it's a pretty extensive problem and it can be really upsetting but if you ever like for example, I spoke with someone last week, they had their stuff in a storage unit and a, like 15 to 25% of the items were covered in mold. Can you just like clean it off of like your furniture and your books and your, you know, lampshades and stuff? Or are you looking at having to really get rid of those items? Um, so there's things to think about. One is what's your health situation right now i will tell i will tell anyone if you have mold growing on stuff you should get rid of it like i really think that's true i don't think that you should be cleaning it um but some people they they assess themselves they're like you know mold doesn't affect me like whatever blah 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 and and if you feel like that that's not an issue and you feel fine and and that's what you want to do like i'm not going to tell someone not to do that but when you're talking about like the types of things that like can't be cleaned versus can be cleaned basically like anything that is porous um so you mentioned like lampshades books um what? mattresses couch cushions down comforters pillows like that kind of stuff clothing that's really cushioned that you can't just put in a, in a washing machine like all this stuff can't really be cleaned because it gets into the cushions it gets into the and you can't get it out and you know, any, anything that is any sort of porous or semi-porous material, or I'll, I'll say porous material. That, so that would include like wood or like the fake pressed wood furniture? So kind of. So there's three categories. There's porous, semi-porous, and then solid. So porous is like your fabrics, linens, plush stuff, you know, th you know things like that. Semi-porous is this middle range. This is where woods come into play, things like that. But there's different types of wood. So like if you have mold growing in compressed wood, um, so like plywood, MDF, like things that are used to build a lot of like the cheaper furniture that we can get, you know, at Target and stuff like that. If you got mold growing on that stuff, you, you know, it's, it's in the layers of the wood. You can't really surface clean it and get it out, right? You could try to surface clean it and we'll look at it and we'll be like, oh, there's nothing else there. We're cool. But the problem is it like gets into it, you know? And so like you cut the surface off. I use the, you know, I, I use the Titanic, this Titanic analogy all the time. I'm like, it's, it wasn't the tip of the iceberg that sunk the boat, right? They actually navigated around it. They got around that. It was everything that was under that they couldn't see. You easily could have chopped the tip of the iceberg off and they still could have navigated the same way. And they still would have taken down the most unsinkable ship. And that's, that's kind of what happens, right? Like what you're seeing is usually like a smaller piece of it and it grows into stuff. So like, but more solid wood things can be cleaned. Um, when, when you're talking physical growth, when you're talking about things like, are they cross contaminated? Meaning there's not growth on them, but maybe they were in a room where you're concerned or something like that. Then, then the, the restrictions kind of lift a little bit in terms of what you can try to clean and what, and what not to clean. I would say, and this is just me personally, and just cause I know this stuff so much and I'm actually dealing with the health effects of it myself. Um, anything that has physical growth on it, it's gone as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that's just my thought on it. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. That's really helpful because these are actual real life situations that I have been presented with in practice. So I know that they are actual questions and concerns that my listeners actually have. And um, I'll be excited to hear what people think of this and any questions. So that way I can have you come back and we can talk about this even more because I know that there is so much to this. I've actually learned quite a lot from following you on Instagram. Um, you have a great Instagram account with a lot of great information. And I know too, um, do you want to share with everyone like how they can get in touch with you? And especially for those who have concerns about what we've discussed and they're dealing with, whether it's rashes or autoimmune issues or anything else, this information is really helpful for a large group of people. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I, so my Instagram account, it's, it's mold finders is the Instagram account. So anyone could go there. I, I basically, I try to give as much as I can in like different places, you know? Um, and then we also have some like, you know, we can do inspections for people directly. We have, you know, a course that we can do that helps people, but the, the, the freebies with all kinds of info is the Instagram account at mold finders. I have a podcast called mold finders radio, um, 80 plus episodes with all kinds of deep dives into so many questions people have. So there's a lot there. And then, um, you know, other things that, that we have, uh, we have a program called mold finders method. Um, it's, it's a way for people. It's like a do it yourself, how to find hidden mold in your own home program. And so there's a webinar attached to it that kind of teaches the core concepts. So like the myths about mold are one of the things that are in there that we talked about earlier and, and some other things. And then there's actually a, 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 it's, it's a program. We literally go through and tell you in every room, this is where you look and this is what you look for. And if you see this, this is a problem and this is how you would test it. And this is how you would remediate it. And this is how you would do all of those things. So it's literally like consulting with me without directly consulting with me basically that's awesome yeah and so that's called mole finders method it's molefindersmethod.com okay. um and then my company for in-person inspections we're called we inspect that's the company that that actually comes out our website is yesweinspect.com and and we help people all over the country so we're national so we, we can go anywhere Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate your time. This was so, this was incredibly informative, shocking. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to go look up into my refrigerator now. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. Um, but it, you know what? It's important because we take for granted, like you said, you don't smell it, you don't see it, you don't think anything's there. But if you're constantly, I mean, fortunately, I don't, I don't drink from the water out of my fridge because mm -hmm. I use a Berkey, but a lot of people do think that because they're drinking out of the fridge, it's filter, filtered, we'll put that in air quotes, so it's better <laughs> for them, but they might not realize until they look that there's actually mold up there. So thank you so much for just bringing this to our attention because it is a huge concern, it's a huge problem, and um, yeah, you're a wealth of knowledge. I really appreciate your time. Oh, I appreciate it. Anytime that you want, if, if, you're, if your followers have questions, your listeners have questions, we can do just like a Q&A swap on Instagram or something or like whatever works, I'd be more than happy to share more. Perfect. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks. Bye-bye. I am so grateful to have had Brian on the show to share some of these spots that honestly, I never even thought of. If you are looking for the resources and how to contact Brian and his company or to check out all of the different things that they offer, including a really fantastic podcast as well, you can head on over to skinterrupt.com forward slash 208. There you can also leave your questions and comments so we can keep the conversation going. And if you know of anyone who is struggling and suspects that mold may be an issue, but they've looked around their home, they don't think it's their home, but they're like, where could I be getting this mycotoxin exposure? This is an excellent resource to share with them. And before you head off for your day, make a point, if you haven't done this yet, to head on over to your podcast platform, rate, review, and then hit the subscribe button. That way you stay connected and plugged in to the Healthy Skin Show community. And we deliver an episode to you each week that will help provide you with resources, tips, inspiration, client stories, different alternative strategies to help you rebuild healthy skin. Thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.